It is Sunday in the world. Welcome to Media Gitao and our continued exploration of Elliot Smith, The uh, Torment Saint, The Life of Elliot Smith by William Todd Schultz here on Media Gitao. <coughs> so, um, as I mentioned, I did the whole long intro, so I'm not going to talk about a whole lot of other stuff right now, except to say we're jumping in. We are starting this audiobook and commentary at Chapter 4, Summit Reverse Pyromaniac. And we're going to Elliot Smith's post-college days. Now, this is page 105, and the book ends on page 330. That is a huge and long endeavor. Um, that's what she said, I guess. So what we're going to have to do, we, the editorial, man, the royal, okay? I, there's a beverage here, man! What we're going to have to do is cut. This is going to be a challenge for we. <laughs> so as I go along, I'm going to be looking for stuff that's cuttable, for lack of a better word. Um, stuff that's boring, stuff that I can't comment on. So, you've gotten your homework. Some of you have already begun on it, uh, which is checking out the albums Figure 8 and XO. Now, I thought about, after when I did yesterday's video, the introduction, my introduction, there's great albums. Either or, I forgot to mention, is another great Elliot Smith album. In fact, all his stuff is great. Uh, no, that's not true. You know, his his first album, Roman Candle, 1994, was kind of just him and an acoustic. Um, and even though it was very lo-fi, now, I wouldn't call that great, but it certainly showed promise and a different kind of wispy, whispery style that would be coming from the likes of Smith uh, in the Northwest, during the mid-90s. What is this dog doing? Hold on. You know, I don't have kids, ladies and gentlemen, but this one is like having an incorrigible toddler. You can't corrige this dog at all. All right, so was all of Elliot Smith's stuff great? No, but as we get into the mid-90s, and when he works on the soundtrack for Goodwill Hunting, um, Miss Misery, and a couple other songs I believe he had in there, shortly after he'd record EXO. Come here. And then Figure Eight. Come on. Come here. All right. Sorry, but now we officially have a companion. Say hello. Okay, she's shy. So, <clears throat> I don't think I can do this, dog. I can't do this. You're a big distraction. Plus, I'm going to have to read soon. Hold on. All right, these canine distractions, I tell you. Is she going to... All right. Um, <laughs> it is Sunday in the world. What more do you want from me? So Elliot Smith's genius would really accumulate as he honed his craft. He didn't come out of the box a genius any more than Kurt Cobain did with, you know, Bleach in 1987. I believe that album came out. Um, it showed promise. Okay. A genius. No, no, no. Okay. Didn't I say I was going to ban this word? All right. But he wasn't amazing in 1994. Elliot Smith was not amazing in 1994. Roman Candle was not amazing. Um, now, if I had my facts straight, if I had his discography right in front of me, I could tell you what was next. It might be XO in 1997. Um, no, it's probably either or in 1997, followed by XO, followed by Figure 8. Followed by, gosh, New Moon. Although I think that was posthumous. You know, Media Gita, for someone who's such an Elliot Smith expert, you might want to know your facts. Well, the fun part is, LNG, I am relearning along with you the facts of Elliot Smith. So where we are jumping in, because I don't want to do a whole bunch of introductory content. That's what I did yesterday. That's what we did. We set the stage. We're jumping in in Elliot's post-collegiate years. Now... As I said, I'm cutting 100 pages, and there's still 220 left to read. If you thought the Kurt Cobain project was long, eight videos uh, for Heavier Than Heaven, not to mention the two that I did in regards to Montage of Heck, then Elliot Smith here is at least a 10-part series. I'm not going to do it... Um, I'm not going to only do that. You know me, things strike my fancy. I'm going to come in with commentary on you know news items i might do uncultured and just other videos honestly <clears throat> it doesn't really matter to me man because 
you know, I appreciate all your viewership, but 45 views is still just 45 views. Okay. My uncle's dog gets 45 views on his uh, new dog bone product line box openings. All right. So, you know, people are incentivized by so-called success. Maybe because my channel is uh, labeled as MGTOW or something. I, I don't know, man. It doesn't matter. But that doesn't discount those of you who have taken the time to say thanks for what I do. And you're welcome. It's completely mutual. Um, if I could say that word, mutual. It's entirely mutual, guys. <clears throat> you know, I enjoy doing it. And I enjoy your comments. And, you know, you can always leave constructive criticism as well. I don't know why I'm inviting that. Because I do a damn fine job. So, go fuck yourself, I guess. Now, as we jump into Elliot Smith's post-college years, one thing that I just read previous to this chapter was how... I don't know. I mean, I guess I'll just read it for you now. Let's see. Where to start? Well, I'm going to have to read the whole paragraph, and I, I just won't comment on it till the end. Elliot's thesis was no doubt right up Mazur's alley. Its title was Toward a Post-Structuralist Feminist Critique of Law, and it zeroed in on procedural changes in the way rape cases got tried in the courts. These were the Foucauldian Derrida days of the death of the author, according to which all interpretations were equal, every reading a misreading, and the self a paper eye. Students dutifully memorized the relativistic deconstruct deconstructionist mantra. All meaning is context-bound, and context is boundless. In Wittgensteinian fashion, people spoke of the end of philosophy, or of its transformation into analyses of language games. Declarations of sincere, unironic belief came for a time to seem passé, the new goal a dismantling into a virtual meaninglessness that was celebrated as some sort of release from dogma and received wisdom. At any rate, this is the intellectual context in which Eliot would have been doing his reading, thinking, and writing. Rape and legal theory was an altogether different matter. Anti-sex feminism was in marginal vogue, leading to anti-pornography law creation of the sort created by Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin. Pornography is the theory, said Robin Morgan, and rape is the practice. <clears throat> in 1983, four years before Eliot started at Hampshire, Dworkin and McKinnon drafted ordinances stides sidestepping obscenity law and labeling pornography a violation of women's civil rights, by virtue of which pornographers might be sued for harm in civil courts. Versions of these ordinances were passed in select cities, for instance, Bellingham, Washington in 1988, although later found to violate freedom of speech protections. In all, adding up to an examination of undecidability and indecipherability on the post-structuralist side, and sexist, male-dominated, patriarchal hegemony on the feminist side, it was more than enough to keep a smart 20-year-old's head spinning. That it did, and more to Eliot, as some of his later comments made plain. But he got it done and went straight through the school, leaving with debt to repay. Retrospectively, he felt he hadn't proved much. The most he showed himself and others, he said, was that he could do something I didn't really want to do for four years. His studies he did find interesting, but they had no practical application in the world. He had a B.A. in philosophy and legal theory. What this allowed him to look forward to were jobs in bakeries or in the spreading of gravel. It wasn't about the academics, anyway. To him, they were just that. Academic. As ever, it was the music that mattered. And Hampshire supplied that, most notably in the person of Neil Gust. Now Gust and Elliot were about to do something remarkable. At first together, then later, intractably separately. <clears throat> So that was the end of uh, chapter three. By the way, when I take these pauses, <laughs> like I wanted to take a sip of coffee, but I realized that would come off as self-satisfied. Like, oh, I've just read something. Let me. Ah. 
Mm. <laughs> no, I just I just wanted to take a sip of coffee. Um, I tell you, everything's got a was I was I man sipping? <laughs> So, I mean, that definitely fits in with what we're talking about here. <clears throat> so, Elliot goes to Hampshire. All right. Now, obviously, I'm jumping in at page 105. So, even I am a little bit lost in the context here, though. Of course, I have read Torment Saint, I think, twice at this point. Um, Smith being one of my favorite musicians. And, of course, I wanted to investigate his life because of that in the same way that I did with Cobain. So, we see... Now, Elliot is decidedly pro-feminist here, right? Yeah, his thesis was... No doubt right up Mazer's Alley. And let's see. Um, Okay, I don't know. Either way, he's writing about all this feminist stuff and getting this crazy fucking indoctrination (coughs) that would go on to just shape his worldview in the same way that Cobain was a self-professed feminist and would have lyrics like, never met a wise man. If so, it's a woman. Okay, okay. But you have to understand, and I guess I will be, hmm, is it lazy? Because I'm not intentionally comparing Cobain and Smith, for example. But when I do, it's because it just seems natural. So I suppose during the course of this series about Smith, which, as I said, is going to be very long, albeit intermittent, because I don't want to bore myself. Um, I don't want to be doing all my videos about Elliot Smith every time. So... The series, you know, what is it, late August? You can count on this series lasting us through the rest of 2018. So, you know, tuck yourselves in and uh, eat a big slab of meat because we're getting ready to hibernate, ladies and gentlemen, this year, for the rest of this year, and our discussions of Elliot Smith. So, uh, happy Labor Day. Happy Halloween, Uh, Happy Thanksgiving, and Merry Christmas in advance as we talk about Elliot Smith. So when I've talked about Kurt Cobain, Anthony Bourdain, David Foster Wallace, and Elliot Smith, uh, when I mentioned all four of them on yesterday's MG introduction, the one thing I neglected to mention was the very obvious, which is that these four men were very indoctrinated by feminism and came to hold on to it dearly. Um, Now, you know, I don't know if, uh, you know... So, I don't want to get off topic. Uh, And they all fucking killed themselves. That's the common thread here. Now, is it feminism's fault that these men killed themselves? No, of course not. We all have that individual autonomy. um, But it it definitely factored in. So, we see 20-year-old Elliot Smith uh, basically becoming indoctrinated and with and believing feminist ideals... Uh, at this Hampshire college. And we see him meeting Neil Gust, okay? As much as I wanted to avoid <clears throat> more introductory stuff, there it is. Let's keep going. Chapter 4, Some Reverse, Pyromaniac. The obligatory grind of college now over, Elliot headed back home to Portland to the kind of existence, or at least living arrangement, he'd always wanted As he said to an interviewer in early early 2001, he started feeling untwisted up as soon as he didn't live with anybody. No more lawn mowing, as in Cedar Hill. No more step-parents, except very occasionally, when necessary. No more attack dogs, loud summertime townies, who enjoyed calling Elliot a faggot. Dorms or half-assed hemming and hawing about what to do with his life. All the adolescent firemen talk evaporated, although other hesitations surfaced temporarily. It was time at least to commit to the idea of making a band. Stranger than fiction, murder of crows, harem scarum, the dabblings went on vacation in Texas, all juvenilia, very promising but overripe. It was time to get serious. And as Denny Swafford, co-owner of Cavity Search Records, put it, things were popping in Portland in 1991. The decade was ushered in less than auspiciously with a legendary literal bang, the cause of which remains a mystery to this day. Right next to Satyricon sat the abject, shabby, Savmore Grub Grocery, pit stop for undesirables, 
alcoholics, junkies, transients, the displaced, distracted, and dysfunctional. It was where Satyricon patrons, many of them local college students from places like Reed and Lewis and Clark, co-mingled with an entirely different series of social strata altogether. Late one night, the place was mysteriously, all too conveniently, blown to bits. Some said gangs were behind the evil doing, others pointed to the place, still others to city administrators who viewed the erasure as a public service. The disappearance of Savmore Grub, so went the basic sentiment, might lead to the disappearance of the people who frequented it, a magical, inexplicable sucking of chaos into a crater. Didn't happen, needless to say. All right, so the grocery store blows up. Cool. Now, Portland in 1991 was popping. What does he say? Yep, things were popping in Portland in 1991. So, Portland, you have to remember before it was Portlandia, it was this weird non destination basically between Los Angeles and Seattle. Seattle itself was a non-destination. I don't know. The narrative goes until this kind of grunge thing happened um, in the era that we're talking about right now, 1991. You know, Elliot Smith in 1991, I think we're even talking about before Nevermind came out because, you know, most bands still view Nevermind as the thing that changed everything in that it gave mass exposure to this so-called grunge music, which they wouldn't have called it that. Uh, people in the grunge scene didn't call it that, even when it was called that. I think they would just call it rock music. We were a rock band, you know, or we're a metal band or something like that. Um, so, let's see, where were we? Yeah, but Portland was just kind of this stop-off. It was just a nothing. Um, you know, what was it known for in the 80s? There, there are always bands coming through, but it was, you know, more akin to Eugene or something. Uh, Eugene actually would be a bigger draw. I know that bands like the Grateful Dead would always play there and even Fish in their earlier days in the late 80s and 90s uh, because Eugene has University of Oregon and it's a big college town. Now, we see that Portland has a bunch of colleges, um, but I get, okay, so Portland's popping in 1991. Um, this would be the beginning of that scene, which has died a pretty slow death. All right, I just had to make my first cut, which is good. I'm glad that I did, and that's how we're going to get through these next 220 pages in less than as many videos. Um, but it was about this store that got bombed and stuff and how sketchy it was. Okay, great. This is my job now, though. Is Now, listen, you know, you know the source material here. I've cited everybody. Um, there will be no lawsuits. If you're curious about some of the more boring shit, pick up the book. In effect, as Portland Rock historian S.P. Clark explains, vital layers of innocence and naivete were peeling away from the Portland scene, replaced by assorted seedy miasmas. Oh, Jesus. This is one thing I mentioned in the thing I just deleted. Um, and if I said it twice, my apologies, but William Todd Schultz, the author of this book here, he's no Charles R. Cross. This is the kind of author who enjoys words like miasmas. Now, admittedly, I have no fucking clue what that means. Uh, oh, and they say, if you don't know, if you don't know what a word means, you should always look it up so that you learn what a new word is. Okay, well, go fuck yourself. I'm not looking up miasmas. All right. Now, my point is that this guy, he, he loves, he smells his own farts, this author. But he is saying what I was saying is that, uh, you know, 1990, this is when Portland becomes really seedy, right? So Portland, just huge heroin problem, even back then. Portland, Seattle, huge heroin problem, the entire West Coast. Okay, now obviously it's other things like meth. Um, well, heroin is still huge all along the West Coast, but meth and molly and you know more current more addictive drug i mean not more addictive all right i don't want, i don't even want to get off on that tangent but sp clark portland rock historian is essentially reflecting my thoughts some kind of metamorphosis seemed near change was percolating physical structures and bit players formed part of the master narrative but the real story 
The one on which the physical structures and bit players depended was the music, the art, the sounds getting made and played. Portland was no average destination, more a second-rung rest stop between far sexier Seattle and San Francisco, where bands most wanted to gig. Interjection. Um, uh, you'll find that when I say a lot of the same things as the author says, it's it's because I'm just remembering what they said and regurgitating it as my own words. Um, essentially. Okay. So he said exactly what I just said right after I said it because I was remembering. Now he's, he's framing it the author, um, Portland's this rest stop between Seattle and San Francisco. Okay, it's just a... Okay, continuing. To Pete Krebs of the band Hazel, Seattle was... Jesus Christ, media g Stop slurring your words. To Pete Krebs of the band Hazel, Seattle was nebulously a little more rough, just a rougher scene overall. The... Guys were even bigger up there, big dudes with long hair, all six foot three like Soundgarden. Portland went, oh, Jesus Christ. Portland was rain saturated, full of wet brick people. There was a great deal of darkness to it, not at all a very light hearted place. We were a backwater, Krebs says. The scene gloomy, somber, and heroin drenched. Even the venues, like Satyricon, were toilets. The Wipers, a late 1980s Portland band, supplied the basic soundtrack in songs like Doomtown, according to which life was incomplete, replete with blank stares and a feeling of non-stop losing. In a word, depressing. The mood leaking out between downpours like dysthymic drizzle. There was also a sense of smallness, of scale, with everybody once removed at most from everybody else. It got to the point, Krebs said, where you could tell who was at a party by the bikes out front. Hookups and drama were commonplace, fueled by drugs, alcohol, punk, rain, and violence. Okay. Well, if you've at all spent time in Portland, this description of the gloomy, depressing, rain-drenched place is largely accurate. I do think that from the time I've spent there, I think people say it rains a lot more than it does. Um, It's not Seattle. I remember seeing Sleepless in Seattle. It rains nine months out of the year in Seattle. I don't know if that's true. Um, But yes, things have changed in Portland. It is no longer so outwardly gloomy, perhaps. Okay? It is now Portlandia. But, I mean, that's a whole other story. Essentially, who is this speaking here? You just read it, Media Detail. Why don't you remember? Okay, Pete Krebs. Yeah, so it's just this kind of fucking heroin-fueled, gloomy, somber um, drama scene. Yeah, I mean, that's still pretty... I don't know. I have some friends in Portland, and they're not using heroin. Um, but yeah, they, you know, fits the description. Seattle, the nominal grunge capital of the world, was corporate, full of bands looking to get signed, hungry for mid- or major label recognition, willing to do what it took to make it big. Portland was different, getting signed Anathema, the kiss of death. People were making music for the sake of it, for the sake of creativity alone, says Jason Mitchell, Elliot's close friend and later tour manager slash merch man. We thought it was like that everywhere. We didn't know any better. It was just phenomenal music all the time. The attitude was, screw labels, we do what we want. And of course, as always, this was part, maybe large part, braggadocio. No serious band works hard performing and writing original music to go nowhere. No serious band aspires to cashless anonymity. But that was the tacit aesthetic. And it was liberating. There was a freedom, originality, creativity and patent level of bizarreness in Portland that defied easy categorization. It was anything goes, and the results were intoxicating. Okay. So, you know, Schultz, basically, Schultz, the author, talking about this punk kind of attitude. Screw labels. We do what we want. Early 90s. Um, Fantastic. Back then, I mean, getting signed to a label 
was a big deal in a way that it's not anymore in a world of self-publishing. So there's only a handful of labels, even in the Portland area, you know, Cavity Search Records, I think Jackpot is a recording, like a local Portland label. Um, and they were just saying, fuck this, we do what we want. Now, Schultz points out the contradiction here. Quote, no serious band works hard performing and writing a mu- original music to go nowhere. End quote. Well, that's not true. I mean, you can work hard on something and also know that it's going nowhere, such as this fucking channel. 15 to 20 bands played the circuit in mixed bills at Satyricon. The X-Ray, La Luna, EJs, with roughly 1,000 loyal followers packing the houses, weekend after weekend. The trend in names was for single staccato monikers, sharp punches to the solar plexus, hazel, sprinkler, pond, lungfish, cracker bash, joy buzzer, sugar boom, bed spins, ice burn, antenna. We joke, says Kreb. Hey, want to go see Table? They're playing with chair this weekend. It was Power pop at its finest, says Denny Swafford. Some strange combination of brilliance and uncomfortable. Just like a circus act, but upbeat and positive. Interjection. Um, Modest Mouse would also be quite a part of this scene at this time. And I like Modest Mouse. They really have this energy. I mean, a lot of their, I don't know, their sound is kind of just all the same. And But I think Isaac Brock is such a fucking nut. He's such a character. I think I watched... What do you mean you think you watched? No, I watched a documentary on them about the... <laughs> why would I even say I think I watched? What am I trying to get away with there? I think I watched. I guess I just wasn't sure about the title of it. But you understand, ladies and gentlemen, endless self-examination. It's like a scanner darkly. You are the one spying on yourself. So I... <laughs> I watched... Uh, that documentary about Modest Mouse, about the lonesome, crowded West, which would come out, I don't know, I'm not the hugest Modest Mouse fan, but I respect what they do. I think they're a nut. They have some good songs, and they worked hard, man. All these bands that are being described here. Now, Schultz is talking about the Portland scene, so we're not necessarily talking about the hardworking, touring bands, because he's talking about all these guys, you know, Table and Chair and Hazel, doing the circuit. So you have 10 to 15 bands all playing the same five to six different clubs every weekend, all opening for each other. It becomes this incestuous little scene. Fine. But as they're talking about his power pop at its finest, it's a good vibe. All right. Despite all the heroin, despite the kind of gloominess that has also been described here, it's musicians supporting musicians, drinking, smoking weed, sure, doing some other drugs, fucking each other, uh, and having a great time in the process. So I don't know. Seems like fun to me. Mm, why did I interject? Let's see, what was the original point? Um, hmm. Not sure. Neil Gust recalls a feeling on arrival of enormous energy and enthusiasm to rock out. It was a competitive and energetic scene. Krebs, for his part, recalls no competition at all. We used to actually draw straws to see who would play first and who would headline. Even posters were made with the express intent of making it difficult to tell who was at the top of the bill. In some ways, Hazel's Krebs epitomized the zeitgeist. Born in Orange County, he ended up at Oregon State University in Corvallis, a talented, artistic kid who didn't apply myself in high school, and who wound up spending time in a military school in Pennsylvania. His dad was a boxer and war hero. His finger blown off at Pearl Harbor his face slanting sideways from angled blows he took in the ring. Just like Elliot, once he got to Portland, Krebs was raised by his biological father, along with a new mom, a stepmother, who herself had two girls from a prior marriage. OSU was cut short when Krebs got diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, for which he received radiation treatment in Portland at St. Vincent's Hospital. It did the trick. There was no chemo. He'd mostly taught himself guitar at age 10, with short-lived lessons from an angry classical guitarist in a wheelchair. For the first few years of his early adolescence, 
All I listened to was the Beatles. A habit, a habit Elliot knew well. Then he came across various journalistic accounts of the punk phenomenon and brought up all the Sex Pistols, Clash, and X records he could get his hands on. X was the band, he says. Needing cash, Krebs found work in a warehouse in what is now called the Pearl District, but which then was anything but Tony. There he met Reed College grad Brady Smith, a bassist who turned him onto the Pixies and Shocking Blue, a band Kurt Cobain also admired. The two wrote an album in A Couple Nights and cobbled together some bass lines. Jody Blail, who later helped form Team Dresh, a serious all-girl band, signed on to play drums. A reedy like Brady Smith, she was small, short-haired, deliriously happy on stage, ferociously feminist off, and out-of-control Muppet, according to Denny Swafford. At the time, Krebs shot pool with a dancer and self-described spirit man named Fred Nemo. They talked casually about adding some sort of performance art element to the group. There was little esoteric or highfalutin about it. They simply thought it might be cool. And so, in a task critical to the success of the band, Nemo supplied psychedelic inflections. Slightly balding with a long, stringy ponytail, he convulsed around the stage. One typical shtick put him in a pink tutu firing plastic heart-shaped arrows into the audience. In a YouTube video of Joe Lewis Punch-Out, performed live at the X-Ray, he ricochets wildly in a calico dress, buffeted by invisible obstacles, in front of a pair of boys, almost jockish, in backwards baseball caps, banging their heads to Blail's complex, disjointed rhythms. The song is hard, but infinitely subtle, intelligent pop, short and sweet. Krebs, in a genius of understatement, plays it totally straight in round glasses, white t-shirt, and blonde hair. He looks, in fact, very much like Cobain. Nemo's whack shit on stage, swinging a rotary phone by its cord, standing on step stool ladders while balancing a pitcher of water on his head, stripping down to his bikini briefs and sliding into a woman's one-piece. Made for its own contrapuntal adornment, the music paid scant notice. Deliberately, it wasn't in on the joke. I had no idea what he was doing most of the time, Krebs says. I didn't want to get fucked with while I was playing. But I never thought of him as anything but a bandmate. J. Hell, a Hazel 7-inch vinyl record, named for Krebs' college girlfriend Janelle, who later sang in the band Trailer Queen, sold 1,500 copies at a rapid pace. Kids picked them up at shows or at independent record stores like The Ooze or Ozone, which Janelle ran and co-owned along with Bruce Grief, and which some considered the nucleus of the Portland music scene at the time. Clearly something exciting and potentially profitable was taking root amid the mayhem and chaos. And in the middle of it, in some ways fomenting it, were two avuncular entrepreneurs, a pair of deeply committed music madmen, and Dylan devotees, Christopher Cooper, and Denny Swafford. All right, interjecting. That whole long paragraph about this performance art and this band in which I still can't really tell how much Elliot Smith was a part. So they're talking about Krebs because he was integral in Elliot Smith's life. Understand that as I read, it's going to sometimes you're going to get content that doesn't pertain directly to Smith. But what it does obviously is the, you know, as the writer intends, as the point of all biographies, is to build a case for Elliot. Not a case, but to give background to who he is and kind of where he comes from in the Portland music scene. You're going to get some content that is extemporaneous, like I just read. Although, you know, it serves a purpose. Retroactively, I wouldn't have read that extremely long paragraph. Having said that, there's more here about Denny Swafford that I'm going to get into. So, um... Not, not cutting at the moment. Swafford made the scene in Portland in 1990, drifting south from Seattle where he worked for bands like Mother Love Bone. At that time, he was enthralled to the haunted addict musician Andrew Wood, who, like Elliot, occasionally recorded alone with a four-track. To Swafford Wood, the subject of a DVD titled Malfunction, the Andy Wood story, was genius in ongoing process. 
Heartbreakingly, he died of a heroin overdose in March 1990. Swafford split town, not sure of his next move. Needing to make money, he got a job at Coffee People on Northwest 23rd in Burnside. Uh, Ritzy Street getting ritzier with shoe shops and upscale salons and a fabulous cheap pizza joint called Escape from New York run by a comically cranky blunt East Coast transplant named Phil. Elliot's dear friend Sean Krogan would work there. The coffee job was joyless. Every day Swafford gathered up his measly tips and beat a path to the record store of Music Millennium, a few paces south, where he spent all he had on seven inches. In the 90s, the chief way to learn about new obscure bands, apart from seeing them live, was through these typically two-track vinyl records. They had an A-side and a B-side. Bands chose the songs extremely carefully because the 7-inch constituted a calling card. It was an oral handshake. Many had inserts with lyric sheets, pictures, or other band-related content, and the covers were artfully designed. Even the vinyl came in different colors, white, dark blue, red. As Swafford's collection grew, each new acquisition slid into protective plastic sleeves. He drew the attention of Christopher Cooper, who worked the store at the time for five bucks per hour. So, what are these guys, cavity search guys? I think this is going to need a lot of cutting. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut a fucking shitload. Let's see here. Give me a second as I read and talk. A lot of, yeah, it's just getting cut. All right. So we've got some of this history now. What was I really going to say? Yeah, I mean, records, dude. Releasing music. So at risk of sounding like an old, I mean, listen, these days are done. You would discover bands through going to the record shop, putting it on. It's a very personal experience. You know, it is a time that is long gone. Because even the concept of cover art, album art, if the primary objective is to get your shit on iTunes and get it in ears, your cover art is just a square. It's just a tiny square on Spotify that I'm looking at right now of Elliot Smith's album. So the effort to make the entire thing an experience, a lot of bands, artists are going, what is the point? There is no point. You know, why put in the effort? If you really if you really want to do something radical nowadays, you have to release your music only on vinyl, only on CD. Do not release your music online. So I'm cutting a lot here, uh, about a page and a half. Soon Elliot would meet Swafford and Cooper, and the event would change the direction of his life and art forever. He was at the time, and like nearly everyone in a band or into music, an Ozone regular. Matt Schultz, who worked at the record shop from the start, recalls Elliot spending three or more, excuse me, spending three hours or more in Ozone once, thumbing through records one by one, saying three or four words the entire time. He felt comfortable there, Swafford adds. It was a safe place in which he could just hang out. To Swafford, Portland was the foundation that allowed Elliot to become the person he was and to blossom. It was the scene, the bands, the politics, the personalities, and it was also the presence of Cavity Search. It's difficult to believe, given his adamantine interests, the way songs easily formed themselves in his head. But for a short period post-college, Elliot had almost completely talked himself out of playing music. In his head, he was, as Gus used to call it all, bunched up. Part of the cause of this mental logjam was, funnily enough, college. Reading Kant and other major philos- excuse me, reading Kant and other major philosophers wasn't a problem. Eliot liked learning about how people think, about categories of understanding and so on. But radical feminist philosophy, a major portion of his program at Hampshire, left him demoralized. Jason Mitchell always felt Eliot was just too sensitive, too emotionally sensitive. He internalized everything, even stuff that wasn't directly about him. As a person, he could never just shrug off or gloss over anything. And it was the same for feminism. I just took everything to heart in a big way, Elliot says. To be a straight white man at the top of the Marxist mountain, fomenting hierarchical and patriarchal power structures was a problem. To his list of woes, it was always uncommonly long, 
Sex and color became the latest additions. The best one could do, and this was the attitude pushed by fringe, heterosex-averse feminists he had spent so much time studying for his thesis, was to identify as a non-sexist white male. Men, by definition, could not be feminists. The more they could do... Excuse me, guys. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the fucking mistakes here. The most they could do was sympathize. Stick up for the sisters. It got to a point, Elliot recalls, where I couldn't look at a girl objectively without thinking of all these questions. He was, in his own mind, unworthy, illegitimate, innately flawed, worthless. He wasn't the solution, he was the problem. And this was an assigned position he recoiled from. The worst thing he could do was embody it in whatever form it might take. He began by searching about for something useful he might pursue in the world. Jobs that were necessary, yet not coveted by anyone else. The very last thing he felt comfortable with, ironically what he would one day become, was to be the straight white guy on the stage going on and on about my feelings. Straight white guy feelings were bullshit. They were what feminism aimed to expose, a power structure implicitly embedded in language itself. Neil Gus was just like, you're just talking yourself out of everything you want to do. He just kept insisting that we were going to start a band, and I kept being like, no. But, there were, but no other option rushed into the breach. And Portland being what it was music taking off, bands living together in apartments and houses all over town, writing original songs. Elliot was thrown back to a reality far more powerful than abstract theory. Music was who he was. It was what he did and what he made. It was the language he spoke. <sighs> Fucking Christ, bro. He... Elliot Smith truly internalized everything just described in regards to how he wanted to be a non-sexist white male and how um, he was part of the problem, essentially. Straight white guy feelings were bullshit. They were what feminism aimed to expose. So, a self-hating white man. A self-hating straight white man. Why? Because of his education, his so-called education and teaching. So, if you want, you know... Feminism is fucking harmful because it makes men feel like the enemy. I mean, it's just one of many reasons. And I really don't want to. I mean, they're putting it right here in the text, you guys. So, oh, all you do is talk about feminism in your videos. Uh, Well, we just had a page about feminism directly related to one of our subjects. So, you know, it doesn't really get much more clear than this. You know, white guilt, guilt at being alive. The MP3 that I made recently. Now, I know that all that you guys think that all I do now is just make artist series. It all it all intertwines and commingles and whatever. So check out my video Lysergia. Um now I didn't actually share with you the LSD trip itself that I had. But one thing that I reflected on, I guess I'll share with you. is that I realize that I have a sense of guilt about being alive. I, I feel guilty for being just me. A sense of shame at life. Guilt of life. It's And it's hard to access that particular place and where I was. And I'm not going to tell you the realizations and the conclusions that I came to. They're too personal and you don't deserve it. Maybe I'll upload it on a private video and share it with you individually. There are some of you who have really been digging my content lately, and that means a lot to me. So, And I know that you, you would listen to this non-judgmentally. But at the same time, I don't think I can share it with anyone except for the one person that I've shared it with in my real life. So, But guilt of life, you guys, you know. Um, do women feel that? I don't think so. <laughs> Do women feel guilty for being alive? Do they feel bad? Do they feel internally, inherently wrong? 
No, that's what our culture tells men they are. But as someone who thinks deeper, feels deeper, cares more than any woman I know, I'm supposed to see women as more in touch and in tune. No, no. You chicks are delusional. Now, you can get to a state... Uh, what's my original thought here? Well, feminism. Okay, we'll get back to that. Women, you can get to a state of bliss and understanding. You probably need to have some kids first because it's your biological drive. That is your purpose on this earth is to have children and find a man. No, no, no. Uh, See, I already fucked up. Your purpose on this earth is to find a man, a good man, who will provide for you. Because that's just how it goes. He used to provide you, you know, a deer he just slaughtered. But now it's money. Okay. It just is what it is, gentlemen. All right. You are utility. But men and women can still operate within that framework if they want to. I'm not going to do it. I see no benefit to it. And honestly, I'm not fucking rich. You know? So... In their minds, I'm I'm not useful either. So good. Uh, Stalemate. Checkmate. Whatever you want to call it. You don't want me. I don't want you. Go fuck yourself. Oh, me. (laughs) Let's pause. Guilt of life. Um, You know. So this idea and me, you know, I don't believe that it... for this to, you know, I was about to say, oh, well, maybe maybe Kurt Cobain and Elliot Smith actually had a point. Maybe um, maybe women were oppressed in the 19, in the long ago days of the 1980s and 90s. They were just, you know, oh, fuck that. They were being given decent opportunities, too. And the further they got away from the home, the worse it's all gotten, etc. Um, but being that nothing's going to change, short of... Immigrants coming in, which they are, in Europe. Oh, but but Donald Trump is a monster for not wanting to see all of your men killed, including you, men, you, and your women raped and taken as war brides, as TFM would say, which is going to happen. Oh, let's just let everyone in. Um, let's let them do it. Let's let's be more culturally sensitive to what um. Al Qaeda? Well, that's that's dated. Media detail, not Al Qaeda. <laughs> to ISIS, you want to be more cult- culturally sensitive to ISIS? Should we embrace their philosophies of killing a lot of people in the name of whatever the fuck they believe in? Oh, you sound so ignorant. Well, you need to be more sensitive to Muslims. No, I do not. No, I do not. So, Elliot Smith, let's get back to the point a little bit here. He started seeing things. In groups and sections, he started, instead of just being able to live your life, work at your job, and, you know, the, the, at the end of this little story, he decides music was also, music was who he was, it was what he did and what he made, it was the language he spoke. Okay, he decides on music because he doesn't want to get some kind of job in the patriarchy through which he will continue to oppress women by being the straight white male that he is. See, just your existence, men, is an offense. So you should kill yourself, like Anthony Bourdain, Elliot Smith, Kurt Cobain, David Foster Wallace, so on and so forth, right? Your existence is a very affront to women who are oppressed, and they need to what? They need to what now? They need to, own, you know, take up more of Instagram? What? Tell me how you're being oppressed, ladies. Yeah, I, I don't really mean to, you know, the red pill rage still exists somewhere, and it comes out. Um... The arguments are so tired now. I don't believe you and I don't care. You know? Um, recently, I overheard a conversation. Um, I was with a friend. He's telling me about someone who, who's talking about how being a man is so great. I, he loves being a man. In what fucking world is what my friend was thinking? What fucking reality are you living in? Oh, but media jeets out. You men own everything and uh, you have a great life. It's great being a man. It's a solitary existence. I've made it better than your shitty thought life in which you rely on attention. Oh, but you could say I just rely on attention from this video. Okay, whatever. The videos aren't about me, believe it or not. 
The videos are about the truth and the reality of life, especially the reality of life of being a man. So Elliot Smith here feels guilt of existence. He feels existential guilt is what I should have been calling it this entire time. He also feels the guilt of being a man, etc. He has internalized the so-called education that only served has has only served over the last 40 plus years to separate men and women. Okay? We were different anyway. Now you're a whole another species. Now, the irony of it is that a lot of, you know, I have a lot of female listeners. Well, this is how men really feel. I can be intelligent and angry at the same time. I can realize you have absolutely no use to my life because you'd be telling me to stop doing your videos. Can't we just cuddle? Shut the fuck up. All you want to do is get in the way of a man's goals. Men can accomplish everything and more without you. Do you mean you sound angry? Okay, who hurt you? Okay, it's fine. I don't even address your criticisms anymore. You either agree with me or you don't. It doesn't matter to me. So, we are getting near. Now, I just went off. It was in- entirely justified. They gave me an entire page about Elliot's internalized shame, which, you know, reminded me of my own discussion about that while on LSD um, just about a week ago. Okay, but I do want to wrap up in a second here. How, lo- how much longer is this chapter? You guys, there's going to need to be a lot of cutting. A lot of cutting. Okay. But I'm going to read a little bit more and we'll call it a day. So Neil won out. Portland, too, in its ambient way. The first step was easiest, a semi-foregone conclusion. Neil had heard Tony Lash's drumming in Harem Scarum on songs like Catholic and Bald Faced Lie. So one half of the rhythm section was set. Tony, as it turned out, was down for starting something new. Surprisingly, he never actually aspired to be a drummer, but he did enjoy rocking out. All three were heavily into the DC Discord bands, picking up steam in the late 80s. Nation of Ulysses, Fugazi. Basically, Elliot said, we kind of wanted to be Fugazi. Another inspiration was Chicago's Urge Overkill, a double singer-songwriter attack led by King Roser and Nash Cato, who met at Northwestern. Butch Vig produced their 1990 record, Cruiser. It was a sound that inspired bands from Smashing Pumpkins to Nirvana, who used Vig for their paradigmatic album, Nevermind. Urge Overkill later opened for Nirvana on the Nevermind tour. The next step, far more difficult and more freighted, was settling on a bassist. Several auditions were held, quite a few in fact, but nothing clicked. Alice Vosmick whom Elliot knew from Lincoln High School, had dated Oberlin grad Brant Peterson. She told Elliot Brant was a bass player. Brant knew Sean Krogan before leaving for college. Krogan was part of the Gresham scene, a group of musicians from a small town in East County, Oregon, about 20 minutes from Portland. So a meeting was arranged. Peterson caught up with Elliot at a cafe or coffee shop, the two sitting at an outside table. There was instant affinity, some of which had to do with the fact that Peterson wore a button proclaiming another citizen for gay rights. At the time, the so-called Oregon Citizens Alliance, led by short, balding hate monger Lon Mabin, was calling homosexuality a crime, leading initiatives to put the question on the ballot. Elliot told Peterson, I like the button. The attitude hurdle was instantly cleared. Brant was an Oregon Episcopal school, Catlin Brat. Each private, expensive school is on the west side of town, full of kids Lincoln students sometimes mixed with, and new from grade school at Ainsworth on Vista. Like Tony Lash, he was raised by a single mom, the manager of a travel agency. There was no abundance of money, private school aside, so Peterson took TriMet to classes. He hung out with disaffected kids downtown, got heavily into the B-52s, Napalm Beach, the Rats, The wipers, is this real, especially blew his mind. And although he grew up playing sax in high school bands, soul jazz configurations, and even spent in a horrible and even spent time in a horrible Devo facsimile, just as Elliot did, named the Spud Boys, he brought his he bought his first bass in nineteen eighty three. Entranced by the possibility of marking out the rhythmic feel of the tune, doing 
contrapuntal harmonic work. The way the bass sits underneath everything and drives the music seems to capture his interest, suggesting a new direction. Before college, Peterson lived in a house on southeast Ankeny with junky roommates who stole his stuff. For money, he washed dishes. Oberlin got him out of this hopeless grind. It was a complete immersion in music and intense musical experience all around. He played with Orestes Delator of Bitch Magnet, learned from an endless list of brilliant drummers. Then in 1989, his elite college liberal arts degree in government and political science behind him, he came back to Portland to live with Oberlin friends and found a job sweeping up for a cabinet installation crew on a shift starting at 3 a.m. I was a pretty committed drinker by then, Peterson says, and just as the bars were closing, my shift would start. The drinking was part of a larger the drinking was part of a larger gestalt, one brand shared with Elliot. As he says, unsparingly and with admirable candor, I was chronically, clinically, severely depressed. Just very sarcastic and negative. I guess I can't fucking pronounce this. Dysthymic is the official name for it. I was the average drunk with no self-awareness. Okay. We're going to end this there, even though it's not a particularly profound place. Who are we talking about? BG Tell, you're reading about these people. You should know their names. Yeah, but understand that the reading and the thinking are entirely two different processes. The fact is, oftentimes when I'm reading and inflecting, etc., I'm also thinking about many things. Um, Brant. Brant Peterson. Okay. Who would go on to be uh, bassist with Elliot Smith? And who else do we have? Pete Krebs we've talked about and Neil Gust. These are all becoming the elements of Heat Miser, which would be Elliot Smith's first real band. So what have we learned? Oh, yeah, that's another point I wanted to go on. So let's go back a couple pages here and Elliot's feminism and stuff and stuff. Um, well, he what majored in philosophy, got a bachelor's in philosophy. I mean, I don't even need to make a punchline. You know, this is I'm, how do we get to this place? You know, let, just get back to your page, me G tab before we talk about that. Uh, you're going to have to pause. Here we go. Page 104. Um, he's, his studies he did find interesting, but they had no practical application in the world. He had a BA in philosophy and legal theory. What this allowed him to look forward to were jobs in bakeries or in the spreading of gravel. Okay. I mean, this is the big joke, right? And this is most of college. This is most of um, your undergraduates, unless you are going into a specific field and have some kind of outcome. Or at the very least, unless you're pursuing something like IT or business or nursing, some kind of very specific field where your degree is probably going to pay off, right? You can look at the rates of graduates for your program. Not graduates, excuse me. Um, you know, people who will go on to work in that field. Unless you're doing that, college is obviously a complete waste of time. So how do we get to this point in the 80s, the late 80s? Well, it's boomer parents, right? It's your mom and dad who, you know, depending on how old you are, but say you're Elliot Smith, it's mom and dad who got, you know, got a degree in something. Now, they wouldn't have even studied philosophy. I mean, again, it's kind of ridiculous. Um... Essentially, without going into it, uh, because I'm not fully informed, you know, they're bachelors. And again, I'm not sure, what did people go to school for back in the 50s and 60s? So let's say they did go for philosophy. Just having that degree um, would lead to a higher pay rate, okay? So why are you getting degrees in things that you literally, if you know that there is no job for it, you know? I mean, did Elliot use college as this major party time? I don't know. It seems that he used it really, um, you know, to become brainwashed. All right. But it's not his fault. 20 year olds are impressionable and they know this and that's what they rely on. And it's, it's created an entire generation of people who believe things that are not true about gender, about feminism, men and women who live with a kind of internalized shame and guilt. And the people I'm talking about are men. Women don't live with internalized shame and guilt for being female, okay? In fact, you use that to your advantage at every turn, which I guess I can understand. Uh, I'd probably do the same thing. So essentially, man, it's, it's Darwinism, it's survivalism, it's evolution. 
you know? A chick is going to do absolutely anything and everything she can in order to survive. Kind of neither here nor there, but essentially remnants from, um, yeah, my diatribe about feminism as presented here in the text. So as we get into video two, we're going to be talking more about this formation of heat miser while also cutting time and content as I go. You have to understand that when I read, sometimes I'm just stuck. I am just stuck. All right. The show must go on. So I can't just ditch paragraphs in the middle, although I think I did do that once here. I'm trying to cut time for you and for me. Um, yeah. But soon enough, we're going to get into um, this life of Elliot Smith in the mid-90s with Heat Miser rocking and rolling and really finding their own voice. So I want to thank you for listening. If you like this video, like this video. Subscribe, tell friends, share. And this has been Media Gitao saying, have a nice day.